so I thought, I mean, beyond Riemannian geometry is quite interesting, uh, quite an interesting topic, but it might be a bit too focused. So maybe I'm, I'm going to say just a few words and extrapolate on that on the very few slides that I left uh, in the presentation. So I choose more to present, um, well, uh, a recent work, well, the, the, the sub, well, series of work we did essentially with Marco Lorenzi uh, on the modeling of the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And, and we are using, uh, I, I will come into that, but a slightly different um, uh, version than, uh, of, of registration than LDDMM, which is stationary velocity field. And I will try to explain how it differs and what's the, uh, what are the differences. Okay, so first, maybe uh, for those who don't know yet, or maybe who already forgot, <laughs> Alzheimer's disease is one of the uh, most common forms of dementia. And basically, if you expect to live long, then 20% of, of, uh, of these people over 80 will develop uh, Alzheimer's disease. So one of the, one of the key issues uh, is to try to understand first what's happening. So this is an example of images at different time points, uh, and potentially to detect uh, Alzheimer. But I think that the diagnosis is not the main problem. The main problem is to be, to be able to measure what's happening. If we want to have drugs, uh, because now, I mean, if you diagnose, uh, it's good, but there's no drug. So uh, if we want to develop drug, we need to be able to measure what's the impact of the drugs. And that's what we're trying to do to try to set up some kind of measurement tool to be able to measure what's happening. And we are, so there, there's many, many different ways we can look at Alzheimer's disease. There's, I mean, if we, if we take the course of the disease, then the first thing is there is a raise of the amyloid markers, so degradation, some peptides, which are degrada degradation of the beta amyloid. Um, then, then there's some functional or metabolic markers. Then here comes into play the atrophy of the brain. And this is basically what we're targeting because, well, we're doing imaging. And so this is where we have something to do. So here there's, there's other people working on uh, markers for uh, PIB markers, for instance, to detect uh, these markers in images and look at where they are. Uh, but, but PET imaging is much more difficult than MR imaging. So we just think this could be a good window to measure things because if we are able to detect people here, then the drug, the effect of the drug should be seen around in this, uh, in this window. And here it's basically arriving at that time, it's basically the diagnosis. So what's interesting is just around the time of diagnosis, can we, what can we measure on Alzheimer's disease? Okay, so if we just look at uh, images, uh, we have the baseline and the two-year follow-up. What's happening in here? Well, the first thing is the uh, ventricles are enlarging quite a lot. So that's the first thing. Second thing, which is quite important, is this is the hippocampus. And you can see that there is a huge decrease of the volume of the hippocampus and an increase of the uh, CSF, which is around. And the third thing is the cortical uh, the, the gray matter, which is here, is decreasing quite a lot as well. So this is what is known. But now the question is, can we try to describe that and to measure that in some kind of integrated framework? And the way to, uh, we choose to do that is to use to try to measure geometric changes through deformations. So if we have an image at one point, we can try to look at what's the deformation to get to the other image and then try to analyze this deformation field, okay? So obviously, we will not consider here all the intensity changes, and actually, we want to be robust to that because that's a real problem. We should not mistake intensity changes for geometrical changes. And then the next thing is if we have sequences of images, so let's, let's say we have patient A and patient B, several time points, what we want is not only to have the pairwise registration, but we, have, we want to have the trajectory for each subject. And now the question is, how do we go from the deformation of each subject to the mean deformation of a template, which is representing the population, the, evolution, the mean evolution at the population level? 
So here for doing that, then one of the things we need to do is some, somehow to pile transport this deformation into uh, the template. But we want to pile transport, pile transport trajectories of deformations. So that's the, the, the whole problem we, uh, we are going to tackle here. OK, and, and the two things is, uh, so the question just, that I just said, how to transport parallel deformation, but also what's, the, what's a convenient mathematical setting to do that? And I'm, be, I'm going to begin by this second question, uh, by describing the uh, stationary velocity field framework. And Oh, I keep that one. Well, OK. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go directly to uh, Riemannian metrics. So one of, one of the ways to do, and I like this way a lot, as, as Sarang recalled, I started my career with ge Riemannian geometry and statistics on manifolds. So I like the Riemannian geometry. Uh, so if we want to put that on groups of deformation, basically the idea is we are taking a, a transformation and if we take a curve in the space of transformations, then the, the, the derivative of that, uh, of that curve at a, at a point will be a velocity field. That's basically the infinitesimal deformation. Okay? So the uh, tangent vector is a speed vector field. So that's this uh, thing. And if we put a right invariant metric, uh, so it basically means that the, the, the norm of the velocity field at this deformation is basically we bring back everything to identity and measure, uh, well, put some kind of metric at the identity. And the kind of metric which works well is basically sub f metric or uh, H-infinite metrics, so basically the framework of reproducible kernel Hilbert space. So there's quite a lot of, uh, uh, and I, I forget uh, here, I don't see in this slide your name, but it should be there. <laughs> I thought I added it. <laughs> uh, and, and then the idea is, is basically we can look for geodesics, and the, 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 the whole Riemannian framework is very nice because, I mean, we can, so basically the initial formulation was by minimizing this thing, time varying velocity fields. Now, the, the nice thing about Riemannian geometry is that we know that Geodesics are parameterized by the initial point and the initial tangent vector. So it means that each geodesic can be characterized by the initial velocity, an, a vector which is characterizing everything. Especially if we start from identity, then we take the initial velocity field, that's just a scalar uh, uh, a field, sorry, a vector field uh, over the image, and this is characterizing the whole uh, deformation, the trajectory, the whole uh, geodesic. OK, the drawback of this uh, is that uh, it is uh, quite expensive to compute and to optimize. So can we do simpler? And one of the things that has been proposed, uh, so it was in 2006, was just to use, uh, instead of using time varying velocity field, why not using stationary velocity field, not depending upon time? And so basically, the idea is you take this velocity field, and to find what's the deformation, then you take one point and you integrate the trajectory. And this is the deformation that it gives. So this idea of using stationary velocity field, we use it for defining polyaffine, so to fuse uh, several rigid or affine transformation together. But also the idea was proposed to parameterize directly some subset of diffeomorphism with stationary velocity fields. And why is that interesting? Well, uh, mathematically, it can be writ written as an exponential. And we can, we can use some algorithm which, which were developed for matrix computations. And one of the interesting algorithms is the scaling and squaring. Basically, if your, if your velocity field is stationary, then you can go from one point to halfway. And if you start at halfway to the end, then just composing the two give you the full deformation. That's exactly what I wrote here. The exponential of v is the composition of v over 2 with itself. And if we use that recursively, then basically we can start with a very good approximation because of, of the exponential, because the velocity field is very small. And then we compose iteratively and, uh, uh, and retrieve the deformation itself. 
So it's a quite, a, quite efficient way of computing the, the deformation itself. So this is one of the first algorithms which is very important. And so it was proposed by uh, Vincent Arsini for, for the computing the deformation itself. And recently, we have updated it to also take into account the Jacobian. And if we compute the Jacobian that way, it's, we are gaining order of magnitude of, of accuracy with respect to just finite differences. So I'm still hearing sometimes people saying, oh, but the deformorphic algorithm is not giving uh, uh, positive Jacobian. There are negative Jacobians. Of course, if you compute the Jacobian with the final displacement field, it doesn't work. So here, we are basically computing, integrating the Jacobian along the trajectory, and this is stable, much more stable. The last algorithm, uh, is, uh, which, is, which is quite interesting, was introduced by another group, by Matthias Bossa uh, from Spain. And the idea is uh, there is a formula which is called the baker campbell hosdorf formula in Lie groups. And if we just imagine that it's working in infinite dimensions, then it reads like that. The composition of two stationary velocity fields is the exponential of, of a stationary velocity field with some correction terms. And this means that if this is a current estimation of the deformation or of the parameter of the deformation, and this is a gradient direction, then we can update directly the parameter of the deformation instead of the deformation itself. And this means that we can, with this formula, we can optimize directly in the space of stationary velocity fields. And that is a, a key to uh, uh, this framework, which is that we don't actually need to leave the Lie algebra of the group. We are doing everything in the Lie algebra. OK, so now the question, and these are my two mathematical slides, <laughs> which are highly simplified with respect to the, uh, the last talk I did. Uh, so the question is, OK, this seems to be nice. Uh, this is a nice setting. We have the algorithms. We're using one parameter subgroup. Seems to work. I will show you that uh, after. Now the question is, can we justify that? And can we see this one parameter subgroup somehow as geodesics? And the answer is yes. And this is the, uh, <laughs> the remark. This is beyond Riemannian geometry. The answer is yes, but generally it is not the geodesics of some Riemannian metric on the group. And the way to see that it's geodesics, it, it can be seen as a geodesic, is we, we can look at geodesics to, uh, using two ways. One way is to say we, we need the shortest path. This is exactly what I described with the geodesics of, uh, on, on, on DFOs. We are trying to compute the, the length of the trajectory or the energy and minimize that. So it's the minimal path characterization. The other characterization of a straight line in a Euclidean space is it's straight. Okay? And to define straight, I need parallelism. I don't need any metric. Okay? So what do I do in a manifold? In a manifold, it's curved. If I have a vector here on one tangent space, I want to compare it with another tangent uh, vector in another tangent space. I need a way to project my vector from one tangent space to a neighboring one. And this is what we call the connection. OK, so it's basically a way to project one tangent space to the neighboring one. And if we have that, then we, could, we can compute second order derivatives, because this is what we need when we, when we want to say that a vector doesn't change. We mean that basically the, the second order derivative is 0. OK, but if we derive, we have a vector which is a time t, and the other one is a tangent space at time t plus epsilon. These are not the same space. We really need a way to connect these two spaces. And if you think about projection, could be a projection like that or like that. I mean, there are many projections that realize that. So that's exactly the case. There are many uh, connections in the, in, the, in, the, in the space. We can choose the connection we want. This defines a parallel transport. And now we can define a geodesic as a curve which stays parallel to itself. So what does it mean? It's, it means that the tangent vector, if I transport it to the neighboring tangent space, is still a tangent vector to the curve. So these are what we call parallel curve or geodesics. And now in Riemannian geometry, the, 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 one of the key theorem is that if you take a metric, there is only one connection 
symmetric connection, which is compatible with this metric. This is the levi civita connection, and the geodesics are obviously the length minimizing in that case. But we can define connections which are not metric, which are not actually minimizing some kind of energy. And that's what we can do on Lie groups. So basically, the idea is if we look for the connections which are invariant by composition on the left or on the right, then we have a unique connection, which is symmetric, which is the Carton connection. So the difference between the, the Riemannian setting is that we only consider right invariant. So we take a metric and we transport it by right translation. Why not on the left? So here we have both invariants by left and right composition, but the price to pay is we don't have any metric which is canonically compatible with this connection. It doesn't mean that we don't use a metric, it just means that there is no canonical metric for which the geodesics are the same. Okay, so the, the, the nice thing is with this connection, we have a space, so we can write the metric and we can compute the curvature, and the curvature is extraordinarily simple uh, with respect to the, <laughs> the one of the, of the LDDFM. Uh, we know that geodesics are left and right trans uh, translation of one parameter subgroup, so we know all the geodesics on the space. They are very simple. Uh, we have invariance by left and right translation. We have also invariance by inversion, meaning that we, we will all automatically be inverse consistent. That's, that's one of the interesting things, if the criterion, the similarity criterion is inverse consistent. Okay, so on the other side, we lose things. Uh, I mean, there's no free lunch. Uh, <laughs> so we lose something. Uh, we lose the fact that we have, uh, th there is generally uh, no compatible metric. Uh, we have geodesic completeness, but it doesn't mean that we can reach any two point by a geodesic. However, as, uh, as I was uh, saying, we can always reach uh, any two point by the constant acceleration curve, which is which might be which is the case of the uh, right invariant metric or constant acceleration curve for this uh, connection. And there are other things in infinite dimensions where actually uh, we might not cover the whole group, but in practice we don't really care because uh, the what we're covering as a set of diffeomorphism is way sufficient. I believe, I haven't seen yet a DFO which is interesting and that we cannot reach with that. So I'm still provoking and asking for one. <laughs> okay, so now we, we have this nice setting. So we know that one parameter subgroups are geodesics. We know that we, can, we, we have geodesics at other points. So how can we do statistics in this space? Well, the, the, the first thing we did in Riemannian geometry was to say, okay, we have a distance, so we have to, trans, to, to rephrase the mean as the Frechet mean, so minimizing the square of the distance, or if we t take not the square, but uh, the minimizing the sum of the distance, we get the median. Well, we don't have distance. But we still have something interesting. If we take the Frechet mean and we take the characterization, then the, the, the characterization is of a fresh mean is it is an exponential bar center. If you are if you are at the fresh mean and you develop everything on the tangent space with the log map, then the mean is zero. And well, we have the log map also with our geodesics. It's a property which is defined by geodesics. So the log map, if it is sufficiently small, then the log map exists, and we can define the means as exponential bar center. So sets of points such that the sum of the, of the, of the log to all, all the other points equals zero. Okay, so this gives us a definition, and it turns out that this definition is locally unique in a sufficiently small neighborhood, and it is left and right invariant, and inverse invariant. So with that, we have a mean which is completely compatible with the group operations. What we lose is that it may not always exist, if we don't have a geodesic to reach the point, then it might not exist. But if it exists, uh, locally it's unique, and I believe that it's even stronger. Uh, I mean, if it is unique for some kind of Riemannian metric, then it should be unique for this uh, definition. But this hasn't been proved yet. So this is the notion of B invariant mean. Now for the covariance matrix, there's, uh, it's more complex. There's no canonical covariance matrix, 
We can still compute covariance matrices, but we have to, re, to, to remind what is the basis in which we compute things. So basically, the idea of this type of space beyond Riemannian geometry, Riemannian geometry is a Euclidean space. You've got a metric, and it's, it's, so you've got an orthonormal coordinate system. Okay? It's locally Euclidean. Here we are locally affine. The coordinate system, you can choose any coordinate system. In this coordinate system, you can compute the covariance matrix, but you have to remember which coordinate system you used. There's no canonical coordinate system. That's it. But if you define one, then you can do everything. OK, so let's go back to the use of that. So basically, the, the idea uh, that was proposed following the, the introduction of the uh, stationary velocity fields framework or idea was to parameterize the deformation with this uh, uh, one parameter subgroup with this, uh, as the exponential of uh, uh, stationary velocity field. And so the idea was, was exploited simultaneously by Matthias Botta, John Ash Ashburner, and a bit later we find a way to put it in the demons. And we call that, we call that the log demons. And it's, this is basically the, the, the type of uh, criterion that we are optimizing. I will not really go into detail in there except that it's inverse consistent when we add the, 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 there's something missing here. We should have also the reverse uh, criterion that we're adding. And it's quite fast, and it's working quite well. OK, so this is the criterion that we, we try to use uh, to follow up deformations in, in time series of images. The main problem is here, this is a detail of two images of ADNI. So we have white matter, but we have an intensity change here. And what's happening is that if we use the demons like that, we have a Jacobian determinant here, which is going very close to zero. And there was no change. Actually, this was an intensity change. So with the SSD criterion here, we are easily mistaking intensity change for geometrical changes. So what we propose to make it uh, correct or working is to actually rephrase that with local correlation coefficient, in which case we are locally invariant to, uh, to biases, intensity biases. And if we do it, so this is the formula, but the only thing is with respect to what uh, we did with Pascal Cachier uh, a long time ago uh, for this criterion, here we're using uh, the midpoint evaluation. We're basically taking both images and transforming them to the half point and comparing them in the middle. So it's somehow similar to the method of Brian Evans, except that Brian Evans has a broken geodesic because it's starting from the middle and with the right invariant metric, then it has to be broken most generally in the middle. We, are, we, we don't have a broken geodesic because basically this is still on the one parameter subgroup and the inverse uh, the, the inverse of the deformation is just given by the exponential of minus v. So it's, it's a bit more, I don't know, it's a bit, just a bit more symmetric. And we can show also that this formulation uh, does, does conserve the efficiency of the, of the demons algorithm, so we have a closed form to compute the update equation. So that's, that's one of the, of the ideas. And one, one of the interesting effects is that if we take two images and add some multiplicative and additive bias, then this is uh, what we observe with different level of noise with the uh, sum of square differences. So this is the Jacobian. So you see that, well, we might have a good estimation if there is no bias, but then with an additive bias, it's okay, but as soon as it's multiplicative, then it's, it's all gone. And with the local correlation coefficient, we're still conserving a good estimation. So this is one of the uh, slight thing, which is not really, I mean, the mathematical insight in there is not really deep, but it's what is making the whole thing work. So from a practical point of view, it's really, really important. OK, we just verify that uh, without specific optimization, we, we compare to the uh, uh, many other algorithms, and it's well ranked. I will not go into detail, because that's one type of evaluation. There are many others. And we are more interested into the quality of the deformation than uh, with the overlap of the, of the regions. But it's, it's just working for general intersubject registration as well as the best method. And it's also working for longitudinal deformations. 
And that's uh, what I'm going to present now. So I'm going back to the original problem. We have a baseline, we have a follow-up, and we are registering uh, between these two images, and we're getting a deformation. And this deformation is parameterized. It's basically the flow of this vector field. So what we can see here is that there is a big expansion of the ventricles, and it seems that there is a lot of things happening here. It's actually a rotation. There is, there is some atrophy, but it's, it's, uh, there is also a big rotation. So now what we want is, given trajectories here, so we will have a stationary velocity field for going from here to here, another one for going from here to here. So it's a time varying stationary velocity field. <laughs> so if we assume that basically the time steps are very close, it's, it's, it's very close to, uh, to some kind of deformation, time varying deformation, without any geodesic assumption. Now the question is how do we transport this trajectory into another uh, template geometry. So basically, we, are, we can do here the registration of the baseline images. And what we would like is to be able to predict what's the deformation of these baseline images corresponding to this deformation here. So from the, um, okay, from, from the uh, mathematical point of view, the idea is, it, it's interesting because uh, with the SVF setting and the LDDMM setting, we, we are still in the extended Riemannian uh, setting, which means that geodesics are characterized by initial velocity fields, well, initial vector. You are at a point, if you know in which direction you shoot, then you can continue your geodesic. So for both methods, what we want to transport is this initial vector which characterizes the deformation, the longitudinal deformation. So we just have to transport the initial vector of the geodesic. So, um, yeah, so that, that's what I said. So just, just to mention, in the LDDMM case, there was uh, an explicit uh, formulation uh, given by, by Laurent Younes, but it's actually completely linked to the LDDMM. What we were looking for is more, a more general way to transport and maybe not only along geodesics, but along some trajectories and, and, and without any knowledge of the, of, the, of the metric itself. So one of the things we, so what, what is parallel transport? So basically we have a vector here and we want to transport it along a curve. So this is basically exactly the action of the connection. Infinitesimally, the connection that we use to define the par, the, the, what is, what is uh, a geodesic is exactly what we want to do here. But knowing the connections means knowing the, the Christopher symbols, and that's complex to implement. So one of the ideas uh, that we developed was to use a, a scheme which was introduced in astrophysics to, well, in, the, in the context of gravitation, gravitation theory. And the idea is that if we are here at this point, we want to prior transport this vector along this piece of curve, then what we can do is build a geodesic, we start with this tangent vector, then compute another geodesic that goes here, take the midpoint, and shoot from here to here, and double the point, and we end up here. And by computing this geodesic, the initial tangent vector is the parallel transport. So what's the interest? Well, we just need the exponential and log maps. And this is what we all implemented for all the manifolds we are working on. So we don't need to know more. This is much more than the, than the geodesics. We just need to know the geodesics here. Obviously, if we have a curve which is long, then we can iterate the procedure, and this is the name, this is why it is called the ladder. Okay, so this is the, the Chills ladder, which was, which was actually introduced not by Chills, but by Ehlers, uh, in the spirit, but it's a construction which is in the spirit of Chills. So it was named after Childs. <laughs> so if we, if we try to apply that for images, the idea is, okay, we've got not, not points, but we've got images. So we're going to register these two images. This gives us this vector. This is the vector. So to make the prior transport, what we should do is basically transport this image all along. So interpolate the image and then do registration from this image to here and then register from here to here and, and so on. Main problem is, we all know that when we're registering, there is, we're trying to smooth 
well, we're minimizing the length, so each time it's an, approximate, uh, an, an approximation, so each time we're minimizing the length of all these geodesics. So it doesn't really work. Uh, but what we can do is, is try to work directly on the space of transformation. So before going to that, I would like to introduce an, a second construction that we actually uh, worked out to try to minimize the number of registration we need. And the idea is, if, if I'm coming here, we have this is a geodesic, this is a geodesic, this is, we have four geodesics here to make the geodesic parallelogram. And this is a standard curve. Now, here, if we assume that this is a piece of geodesic, we can replace the construction with this one. This is a geodesic, and here we need only one geodesic and a second one. So we, we just have, we can, we can remove one geodesic at least, in this construction. So here, if this arc is a geodesic, we just need to register from here to here, double that, we end up here, and then by doing the, computing the geodesic here, we have the prior transport of the vector. And now we can iterate, oops, we can iterate that, and we call that the pole ladder, because it looks like a pole ladder, with, with when you, you have a central axis and then different poles on which you, 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 you climb. And here, we are minimizing quite a lot. We're dividing by, uh, I think we're removing one third of the registration needed to compute that. But we can do even more. We can, since we are in the, uh, in the uh, stationary velocity field, we have the exponential and the exponential, and what we want is to compute this one to close the, the, the triangle. And we have the BCH for the composition of two exponential. So basically, this exponential here we can, we can compute it as this composition. So basically, we are, we are doing that and that. And so we, sh we can show that this is just this exact formula. And we can approximate that either with computation, computing the differential, or using the BCH. And what we're using right now is this approximation. And if we, uh, if we do that on, oops, on images, so this is, uh, this is a, a, a phantom well, synthetic deformation, so this is mimicking uh, a brain with some white matter, some CSF, and gray matter. So this is a guy who is really uh, clever, a lot of gray matter. And, and this is another guy, so this is Mr. Circle and Mr. Ellipse, and, and they're, they're gonna, Mr. Circle is going to lose some, some gray matter. Uh, so there's going to be some atrophy, and what we want is, so this is the uh, Jacobian that we can compute, or the Lord Jacobian here. And we want to transport that in, uh, in the template space, which is Mr. Ellipsoid. And this is the results with different type of transport. Uh, so here the Chills ladder, and here two types of transport, which are well, the left and the right transport. So these correspond to connections with torsion. So I don't want to enter into detail. So it's just to show that actually here we have uh, more noise on, on two of these. I mean, we have exact formula for these three. These are exact formula, but the implementation is still more noisy than going through the discrete implementation scheme. So there's something interesting here, which is, I mean, I think there's much more to, to, to find by going into the uh, details of the implementation and the quality of the approximation that we are doing all behind this uh, deformation schemes. Okay, so I'm just going to... Uh, advance a little bit because I think it's more interesting to show the effect of all that on real subjects. So basically the idea of the, of the, uh, uh, our setup is we have a template here, there is a group trajectory, and now this group trajectory is, this is the general, I'm describing the generative model and then how we estimate things. So we have the template, the group trajectory. This group trajectory is transported using some kind of parallel transport into the patient space. Then there is some noise on the trajectory. We generate the image, and then there is some noise on the image as well. This is the generative model. And if we try to estimate the inverse model, well, basically we go from the pairwise registration, then from the pairwise registration we, have, we can estimate a longitudinal deformation. Which, which, is, which can be way smoother than just uh, the registration from uh, baseline to the current point. Then we parallel transport this trajectory and we can compute the mean um, trajectory here, which is 
the, the parameter of our model. So we are, we are just using, uh, well, geodesics here, a geodesic model, so it's basically a linear model in the trajectory space, but a linear model in the space of stationary velocity field is highly nonlinear in the image space, I mean, if we, in terms of deformation. So that's one of the uh, interesting things. So we tested that on ADNI, so I'm not gonna introduce uh, ADNI. Uh, this is the result we got for the first experiment. So here we're just displaying uh, what are the, the, um, the Jacobian values. So in, in, in red, the expansion, and in, in blue, the contractions. So we can see that here we have a contraction on the, on the hypercampus, and we have expansion, large expansion in the ventricles. But this was known for, for a while. I mean, if you look at the paper by Paul Thompson or whatever, there's, there's hundreds of papers showing that. What's much more interesting is that with the prior transport, we've got the mean trajectory, which is behind. And see here we can see the vectors themselves. So it's, it's basically the infinitesimal deformation that we should flow around to get the deformation. But we can also apply this deformation to the template image. And what we've done here is to take 70 subjects, images one year apart, we do the parallel transport, well, register them uh, longitudinally, parallel transport, compute the mean, and this is giving us a, a velocity field. And now we can rescale this velocity field to expand the time frame from minus seven to plus seven years. So this is estimated just on one year, and we are extrapolating on 14 years. And what do you see? Well, it looks like a young brain, and it looks like it's getting to a quite quite all the brain, but if you look carefully, there's nothing wrong in this deformation. It, looks, it always looks like a, a, well, a real brain somehow. And what's interesting is, I think it might be completely well, off, but at least it's not exploding. <laughs> because if you try to extrapolate any non-deformorphic registration, you're gonna blow up your image. So that's, that's the first result for me, it looks like a good anatomical deformation. So the first lesson is maybe the, the, the expansion is just taking care of a large part of the nonlinearities, and now we are in a almost linear space and we can do our statistics as usual. So that would be already, I mean, if we can prove that, that would be a very good advance. Okay, more interestingly, uh, this is what happened if we take the trajectory uh, on, on all the patients, and here we can, for, for all the patients, we can compute pointwise the Jacobian or the log Jacobian, transport that, it's just a simple resampling, and do a, a t-test to, to, to try to determine what are the, uh, the, the, the parts which are significantly different in Alzheimer versus control. So this is the standard t-test statistics that we obtain with our data. Now we can also take the trajectory, transport the trajectories, and do the, uh, the, the multivariate uh, t-test on the deformation trajectories. And this is the result of the t-test on the, trajectory, the transported trajectories. And what you see is that, well, basically it seems that we're losing just a little bit here, but globally we're not losing statistical significance. And this is quite interesting because normally when you, the more you transport, the more complex is your pipeline, the less powerful is are the statistics. So in this case, uh, so it should be the value of the t-test. Yeah, I think it's the z-score. Yeah, so it's, it's basically, um, it's basically what, what, is, what is between between five and well, above five or below minus five is statistically significant. So now it's, it's, it's obviously corrected, all that we correct with multiple, for the multiple comparison problem. So it's, it's all with permutation tests uh, to have things, but it's basically what is uh, positive is increase, what is negative is decrease, and it's just what is color is statistically significant. That's the, <laughs> the, the, the idea of the picture. Yep. 
Yes. Well, here it's just on it's just on on two time points. So we just have one characterization. Now if we go to a trajectory with multiple time points and really it it depends of what what we do. So the 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 initial idea was to use several time points but still a geodesic model. In this case, we still have the same thing. If we're going to a higher model, higher order model or if we transport all the, 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 the stationary velocity field, we get something which is not a geodesic, and then we need to go into something else. Okay, so um, another thing that we tested, uh, so that was at Mikai uh, last year, and, and we thought, okay, we can detect things, Alzheimer versus control. It's nice, but it's evident. I mean, it's when you look at the longitudinal trajectories, there's almost no point. It's, it's almost, everybody can do that. <laughs> it's very, very clear. Now, can we distinguish controls versus controls? That's more interesting. And if you take the controls of Alzheimer, they have other clinical variables. One of these variables is amyloid beta 112, or 142, sorry which is basically one type of measure of the degradation of amyloid beta in, which is present in the CSF. And we, can, we just stratify the population in two subpopulations, so those who are positive to this marker and the ones who are negative. And we assume that the ones who are A beta negatives are no more aging people. The ones who have a positive marker, they're considered to be at risk for Alzheimer's. And now the question is, a few years before the diagnosis, at least five years before the diagnosis, can we see some difference in the evolution? And so this is the stationary velocity field we find over three years uh, here for uh, the normal group, so A beta negative. And okay, here I, instead of, of putting the, the deformation fields, I put the extrapolation of the deformation, so over 15 years. So this is what we should we consider as normal aging. This is the other group. Well, you don't see anything. Well, if we, if we look a bit closer, then there are places where we see something. There is an accelerated atrophy in A beta positive versus A beta negative. So it's difficult to see, but if we come to the statistics, this is where the, lo the, the location of the atrophy for normal people, so normal aging. This is the atrophy that we have to add for the A beta positive. And just to see this is the pattern that we have for Alzheimer. What you, what you see is this is the, what, what Alzheimer patients have to add to that. So basically, it seems that we have some kind of uh, Alzheimer atrophy, but just starting. Not as, not as developed. And more interesting, if we try to make the statistics now between A beta positive, while well, the trajectories, the mean trajectory, well, the, no, the tr transported trajectory of A beta positive versus A beta negative, we have some statistical significance, including in the, uh, in the hippocampus. And this statistical significance, we didn't have it on the Jacobian. So that's, that's interesting also to see that we can be even more powerful than the standard statistics by using multivariate statistics. But multivariate statistics on it's, uh, it, it's um, uh, infinitesimal deformation. It's not Jacobian. Jacobian values are differential of that values. So we are, we are avoiding, by avoiding the differentials, we can be more powerful. Yes. 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 So we, we have we have actually one one we have two populations. Is it exactly like we, we can consider it differently? Here it's just for visualization. We we said what we should add. Okay? It's just to see what is in addition. Because if we just uh, put well the difference in in intensity, then it's not very visible. What is, the, what is the thing, but the, behind the test, we have two trajectories. So we have basically 
two sets of velocity fields, and we're asking where are the differences between these two populations, uh, this, these two yeah, populations of velocity fields. So we, yes, but we we can we can here we come to something else. I mean, all that can be done without without. I mean, the geodesics don't need a metric, but when we compare things, then we take a metric. So I'm not saying that we don't want to use any metric. I'm just saying that I would like to have things which are as much as possible independent of the metric. And in the first place, if I'm computing things in the Euclidean space, I don't want, I mean, the mean should be invariant. It doesn't depend on the metric. So the first thing should, now if I'm going to PCA, of course it depends on the metric, and you have to choose it. But you can choose it based on the observations. You don't need to set it on the initial space. You can, you can actually derive implicitly the metric if you use some uh, statistical formulation you can actually have the metric on the observation themselves rather than on the base space. So it's... So now, okay, the follow-up is, given, if, uh, have you looked at the angle between the two velocity fields using the PLC metric? How... No. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, but I don't want to see the angle because the... <laughs> no, no, they, they, there's no point. You, we, we are in very large dimension. The angle is 90 degrees. Statistically, in high dimension, your angle is 90 degrees. Yes. Nothing to point. <laughs> so statistically, the angle is not, is not interesting. What is more interesting is what you should add. And that's, that's, that's another idea, and I think I'm going to it. Uh, uh, it's, it's at the end, so maybe I don't know which, which time I have to go through it, but it, the idea is more to decompose into what's normal and what's not yes. along the normal component. And that's, that is what I will show at the end. OK, so just quickly, um, so now we, we, we have a way to compute mean trajectories. That's nice. But we would like to go to, to the interpretation of that. What's happening? Where are the regions where we, which, which basically change? What are, where are the regions where there is atrophy? And the second question is, can we extract some measures, not just multivariate measures, which is, this is the, result, the previous results were just discovery. If we want to go to a biomarker, we need a way, a reproducible way to measure. So how can we get to that? So one of the idea is, well, we, we, I'm just repeating, we have our stationary velocity field. And one of the ideas that we can, since it's a, it is a velocity field, we can decompose it using uh, Helmholtz decomposition. And interestingly, well, the Helmholtz decomposition is the gradient of a scalar function plus, so which, is, which gives a near-rotational component, and a divergence-free component, which is basically the, 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 the rotational, well, the, the uh, gradient of a, a, a vector potential. And what is very really interesting is that this is encoding all the volume changes. So in Alzheimer, we're just thinking about where is the atrophy. That's what I'm talking right from the beginning. Well, the atrophy is there. I don't care this one. So the idea is we can focus on this part. And what's interesting is, do you remember there was here a big component here? And if we look carefully, once we remove the, the, the vorticity, then this is basically a rotation of the two uh, lobes here. There is a big rotation. And the atrophy is located around the uh, hippocampus. So it's interesting to see that actually the, the structural readjustment may hide a lot of things in the atrophy itself. OK, so now the idea is if we can do this decomposition, which we can. Yes, 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 the initial velocity field. No, it's telling you, no, no, it's not telling you anything about the final displacement. There is, a, there is an intertwining between the rotational part and the... the uh, you say, you know, 
No, but it's, it's, I mean, it's a vorticity. It's the equivalent of a rotation, but in this finite dimensional space. And it's, it's basically pure vort local rotation. But, no, but it's, it's uh, no, no, after that, there is a composite, yeah. The, 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 the final deformation, the, well, the velocity itself, there is an intertwining. But the two parts remain, uh, they do remain separate. yes, ask, ask Sarong. <laughs> no, I mean, the, yeah, yeah. Let me say it one more time. The the hood clearly is a problem. It's not an error, but the one the one we're doing is is created by one error. Yeah, but it's not rotation. But the other one doesn't stay cool. No. Okay, but here, I mean, we are integrating a stationary velocity field, so it's always the same for all time points. Oh, yeah, so, so it does stay. <laughs> So that's that's even worse. In our case, we don't really care <laughs> because it's 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 always conserved. In the case of the 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 well, if you try to see it with the Riemannian point of view, it's different. Okay, so the idea is we can get this decomposition using Helmholtz decomposition. So it's basically solving the Poisson equation to find the potential. And yep. Yeah, so what we have is basically we have this is the pressure field that is corresponding to that. And if we're taking the, 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 um, uh, the gradient of the, well, the divergence of the gradient, well, the Laplacian of the pressure field, then we have exactly uh, the, the divergence of the original velocity field. And this means that if we measure, well, by the divergence theorem, if we measure things, if we take an interface here and we measure what's flowing out of this region, this is just given by the integral of this field here. So it means that we can completely work on the, the, this uh, scalar maps. And now the idea is we've got one scalar map for each patient. How can we analyze that at the group level? And what we want to find is what are the local minimum, the local maxima. And obviously, this depends how they merge, what's the size of the regions, things like that. So here there is a whole topological analysis to develop, and it's related to, uh, to well, probably the, 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 the well, um, well, we're looking at several ways to do that. What we did so far is, is just um, an analysis which is very simple. So this is the pressure map. We want to find what are the big actors in there. So which, what we can try to find is what are the minimum and the maximum. So here is the minimum. And what's the size of the areas which are contracting to the minimum and expanding from the, from the maximum? So it's basically, this is a huge depression of, uh, of, on, on Belgium, and it's always sunny in Nice. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so this is basically what we're trying to find, but from a statistical point of view. So what we, what we did uh, is basically take all the velocity fields, average them, find the local minimum, the local maximum, symmetrize all that, and what came out of this analysis is the location of, uh, if I remember well, 15 regions. Or it should be maybe 16, because it's symmetrized. So these are the regions, and the regions in green are expanding. The region in blue, uh, in, 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 in red, sorry, uh, are contracting regions. So, but this is just the base location. And then to define the, well, the areas which are counting around, then we, we are just trying to find what is the, uh, what is the basin of attraction. So it's, so far, it's, it's not so, it's, it's a kind of topological averaging, but there, there's still a lot of work to do here to do that uh, in a clean way. But what's interesting is that now with these probabilistic regions, so what we have by averaging the region over each patient is a probabilistic mask in the template. And if you remember well, the, what I said about the divergence, we come back, we, we can compute the divergence over a surface by integrating, uh, so I should get, go back here. Yeah, we can integrate here uh, the, the divergence over a region, and it gives us the flux over the surface. So now if the, if the surface is changing so if, if we have random samples of this surface, it would correspond to have random samples of the divergence here. 
It's exactly equivalent. So meaning that if we do a probabilistic mask based on the divergence, we have a, a, a random, well, we have the expectation of the flux through the random surface. So this is one of the interesting points which, uh, which is behind that. It means that we can do expectation of flux over random surfaces just by integrating uh, over volumes. And this is what we, what we have here. We have the probabilistic regions. So this is a mask. And by integrating, by transporting this region to a patient uh, space, we are getting a new mask, which is a patient specific. And now we can integrate the velocity field, the longitudinal velocity field, to get some measurements of atrophy in each of the regions. And this is uh, the points, so this, these are several experiments, and this is basically the regions that we find statistically significant when we compare several well, population, Alzheimer versus control, or A beta positive versus A beta negative. But now the difference is that instead of having uh, a velocity fields, to compare velocity fields with a lot of degrees of freedom, we have 16 values because we have only 16 regions. And we can show that now we can, we can do some sample size analysis. And based on that, well, we, 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 we can show that we are at the level of the, of the power of the, of the BSI method, which is used by, well, for, for some clinical trials. So what's interesting is that we are, we are, we are arriving up to the, uh, well, a power which is usable in clinical practice. So we just use also that method for the challenge uh, that was at Mikai. And obviously, we are not measuring. The, the whole challenge was based on volume measurements. And we are not measuring volumes. We are measure, measuring flux, which is somehow a percentage of volume change. So we had to discuss a lot on how to introduce that in their statistical analysis. But for the regions uh, that the, uh, uh, the, the well, this, where they decided that it could be possible, which is basically the hippocampus, we came out, I think, first rank for the right hippocampus and second rank for the left. <laughs> so we, that, that's an interesting thing. None of the method was symmetric. <laughs> and, well, <laughs> is there a difference between the two hemispheres? There might be a question, or is there some bias in the methods? I think it's more coming from here. But <laughs> Okay, so it's just to, uh, to say that. Now, I'm really late, but I, I just want to, to, to finish with your remark. Uh, one of the ideas is that if we now take a, a cross-sectional study, and we, we have a template, and we are, we are computing the deformation from the template to the subject, now we can ask one thing. What is the part of that deformation which is due to normal aging? What's the part which is not due to normal aging? And now we're going to consider so this is, this is basically the idea. I'm registering the template to the observed anatomy. So I've got a stationary velocity field. From the previous analysis, I've got, I've got the direction of the healthy aging. If I take a metric, and here the metric is important, I can do an orthogonal projection and find the closest point. And here is what it goes. We have the normal aging component and then the orthogonal component, which we call uh, disease-specific. And what's then now we, in this model, in this decomposition, we have two things. We have the virtual age and the specific component. So this is a scalar, and this is still a velocity field. And if, yep. The v-specific, uh, well, actually, it's, 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 no, no it's, it's not really depending. It's once you find the, the age, you have a unique V-specific. It's the part which is not explained by the, by the normal aging. So obviously, because this is an orthogonal component, this depends on the metric we choose. And this is for subject, it's not group one. So this one has, was computed yeah, group-wise. Group but this is subject-specific. This is... Just taking the template to subject registration for one subject and decomposing it. And if we do that, and if we try to analyze this time value here, so what's the acceleration of aging 
Then we have the values for healthy, which is zero, normal, because uh, that's what we consider as normal aging. So that's the, the, the control group. This is A beta positive, so we see that there is some kind of acceleration. For MCI, well, MCI is stable, is not statistically significant, but MCI converters are statistically older than the controls. And obviously, ADR, there is some kind of acceleration of aging. But contrarily to some studies which have observed that and concluded, well, so a, uh, Alzheimer's disease or Alzheimer's atrophy is an acceleration of aging. What we say is there is an orthogonal component. It is not only acceleration of aging. There is something else. And this is what we found uh, for, uh, so let's, let me see, uh, yeah. The, the orthogonal component for the uh, uh, A-beta positive, MCI is stable, so it's basically what's interesting is that it's, it's a bit everywhere, so it's not really specific, but we're beginning to see uh, a, 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 an important atrophy in the hypercampus here for MCI converters that we find for the, for the Alzheimer. And obviously we find also the increase of the volume of the uh, uh, horn of the ventricle, which is close by uh, here also. So this is basically, I think, uh, yeah, concluding my talk. So I just uh, advocate for stationary velocity field. It's just simple. <laughs> And, and, and the question that I would like to push a bit more, and I, I think now we have all the tools to try to compare all these trajectories between different methods, is what is the curvature that is or the, the, the metric? What does it bring? What's important? Is it important or not? I don't know. It seems that uh, integrating the flow with a stationary ve velocity field is already taking a large part of the, of the non-linearity. Is it sufficient or not? I have no idea. We should now dig a bit more to see, do we find similar results or not? Um, that's, that's more or less the, the, the conclusion. I think I have two more things. Uh, I'd like to make two announcements. We are organizing a, a conference on the geometric science of information in Paris at the end of the month, and they are still so the deadline for submitting has been changed. It's in uh, two weeks now, the th uh, I think. Uh, so if you're interested to submit a paper, just let me know. Or if you're interested to come, uh, I mean, you can uh, visit the, sit the site. And we're most probably being <laughs> organizing <laughs> uh, next edition of the Mathematical uh, Foundation of Computational Anatomy with Sarang uh, in, uh, in, in Japan, uh, associated with Mikai. So if you have nice paper that were rejected from EP, <laughs> think of us. <laughs> so thank you very much.